Now we've got Lori Sowers from Rogue Community College, who's going to give you just a little different way that they're doing, just a little different way uh, that they're doing this process at Rogue. Because I got my notes too. Okay, so from, whoops, now we need to get back to the first one. There, there we go. So from mapping to assessment at Rogue, um, this is a big picture compared to uh, what we heard from Christy this morning. And um, so let's just, um, let's just move on through. We are starting with mapping which is, it'll be interesting to see if the story I'm telling is anything like the story that they had from uh, a couple decades ago. Um, and I want to start just looking at a couple of the, the accreditation standards as kind of setting the stage for how we're doing uh, the work at Rogue and why we're doing the work we're doing at Rogue on mapping. So one of the accreditation standards, 2C4, says, and I've shortened it just to, uh, for, to focus here, degree programs demonstrate a coherent design with appropriate breadth, depth, sequencing of courses, and synthesis of learning. Okay. Um, and another standard, part of standard two is the related instruction components of programs have identifiable and accessible learning outcomes that align with and support program goals or intended outcomes. So we are, we are focusing on program learning outcomes, um, and we have been for um, a year or two. And next, um, a sta one of the standard four statements is, in the institution uses the results of its assessment of student learning to inform academic and learning support planning and practices that lead to enhancement of student learning achievements. So zoom back from what Christy was talking about, and we're going to look at program uh, learning outcomes and how we're how we are thinking about and representing programs um, and how we're th um, aligning course learning outcomes with the program learning outcomes okay so how do we design curricula that have clear coherence sequencing and synthesis of learning how do we do that how do we show the alignment of learning outcomes and how do we create a system that clearly uses the results of assessment to inform planning practices? Okay. Now I'm ahead of myself. Um, so um, a quote from the, the book series that um, is the framework that we're using says, being able to think in visual images reveals connections and relationships that are difficult to communicate through text. So this is a very visual approach that we're taking to um, building programs and um, showing the connections within and outside the programs. Okay. The first thing to um, keep in mind is that departments are not the same thing as programs. So we have departments that administer courses, that hire faculty, and that may oversee programs. But a program is um, a um, intentional set of learning experiences that results in a degree or a certificate. And it's going to have courses from um, many different departments, or at least some different departments. So the first thing that we grappled with when we were thinking about redoing our program review, which we did, um, last summer is, are we talking about a department review or are we talking about a program review? Okay, and we are talking about a program review, but it gets really complicated because it's the actual department who's doing that work. So um, if we just take a look at um, the way we typically represent our programs and the way students typically see the programs, they're listings of courses, term by term. So this is the RCC graduation guide for the Medical Assistant Certificate Program. And we're zooming in just a little bit so we can see the list of prerequisites, five prerequisites um, before the, the content, uh, the beginning work of the por core program, okay? And then these are the three terms of the program. It's a three-term certificate program. Again, a list of courses, and the list is pretty much, I think, in alphabetical and then numerical order, which is fine. Um, might not see a lot of connections between the courses seeing that list. 
Okay, and then the next slide shows the, the list of electives that are approved electives for this program. Um, the students in this program can take a maximum of three credits. The program is pretty jam-packed. Um, so there are some one credit courses, a couple two credit courses, and several three credit courses. Um, pick from that set of electives um, is what the students do. Okay. So where do we see sequences, connections, and alignment with learning outcomes, where do we see the curriculum as a system? Okay. So our approach is to build visual curriculum maps for all of our degree and certificate programs. And that's the work we've been doing for um, a couple of years now. Um, it's gaining momentum as faculty sort of get on board with uh, what the work is and how it benefits them. And you'll see a little of that um, as we go through these slides. So just as a reminder, this is what the uh, program looks like to students as they're um, looking at the catalog. Okay. This is um, what our curriculum maps look like, and we're going to be filling in some details as, we, um, as Elizabeth clicks through <laughs> the slides. Um, so the first thing to note, um, so hold on with your clicker, it's okay, it's okay. Um, the, the inner uh, dotted line, oval, represents the core courses in the program. The outer dotted line also includes the electives that are in the program. Okay, now we'll start to walk through some of the details. Okay, now, so the program learning outcomes are on the far right, and the program learning outcomes are developed in collaboration with external stakeholders. So advisory committees, um, employers, local employers. Very close working relationship with them to make sure that our program learning outcomes reflect what they want our students to be able to do when they graduate with this certificate or degree. Um, we also have um, our advisory committees involved in reviewing and revising the program learning outcomes um, so that they feel that they're very much a part of the process of what is this degree, what are the, um, the outcomes that, um, that we're getting trying to get students to. Okay. Um, another feature is that we include real world roles, so the intended roles for our students beyond the scope of this certificate or degree. So we want to be thinking about the bigger context of our students' lives. What are they going to be doing out there in the world as a medical assistant, but also as a citizen of, demo of a democracy, as a taxpayer, as an employee, um, and what are the kinds of things that we are envisioning them doing out there in the world. Okay. Another feature of these maps is that there's a left to right flow into and through the program. So we start to capture the learner's journey from begin to end. Um, and this particular example would be a four-term program with some prerequisites. So term by term, ideally the full-time student is moving through on that time frame. That's not usually, the, that's not reality, but that's how the program is constructed. And then we have um, learning experiences that are represented, and they're color-coded, so we can easily see the core courses, and those are the ones in, um, hmm, don't know what that color is up here. Um, <laughs> khaki, <laughs> it's khaki, yeah, okay. And then the next ones are the electives, so you just choose a different color and um, identify the electives for the program. And then the prerequisites. And finally, up in blue, which are at the top here, are um, co-curricular learning experiences. And that's a, um, a fairly new addition to um, how I'm thinking about these maps, how we're thinking about the maps. So that might be an internship or um, something that is uh, beyond the scope of a credit course, but that is an experience that contributes to the learning and um, toward meeting the, the program outcomes. Okay. Next, uh oh, okay. Um, Did you say what the green is? This? Um, no, it's oh, it's up at the circle. Oh, I'm gonna get there. 
Yeah. Just wait. <laughs> I'm going to make you wait. <laughs> okay. Another thing that we show with these maps are connections um, and relationships between the learning experiences. Hit it, Elizabeth. Okay, so one thing we can represent is um, a close sequence of courses, so maybe a two-term um, chemistry course where they have to be taken in that order. The students have to complete the first one before they can do the second one. Okay, next. There might be a thematic relationship between the courses, so maybe a lecture and a lab combination. They're both in the same term and they have a close relationship to each other. Okay. And then some sequential relationships between the courses. Um, so perhaps where the learning outcomes for the prerequisite feed into the learning outcomes in the next course. So there's some reason why this course needs to be taken before the next course. Why do I need to take that course? There's why. Because you need to meet those outcomes before you move on to the next course. Okay. Um, let's see what, oh, so um, this shows that we want to see the connection between each course and something else in the program. So this just fills in that information. Every, con every course, every learning experience is that we've said needs to be in the program should have a relationship to something in the program, okay? So the, the last one was the connections between those co-curricular experiences and something else in the program. Um, and in this case, we've pointed, I've pointed both of those toward that green crescent, which is ta -da, the program learning outcome assessment points. So what we're saying in this map is that um, for this kind of mock version of a, of a program, all of the program learning outcomes are assessed in this final course, which might be a capstone, a practicum course, where the students have an opportunity to uh, synthesize and integrate all their learning, and they're demonstrating at that point that they've uh, achieved the program learning outcomes, all of the program learning outcomes. Uh, no, the maps are not all like that, but I just wanted to make this first one um, easy to see. Okay, so who builds the maps? How are the maps created? And then what do they look like at the end of a mapping session? Okay. Um, we, the faculty in the program are invited to participate in a mapping session. And I actually made that faculty slash staff because I think we need to broaden who's included in the mapping sessions. We've done it with program faculty, departmental faculty usually, um, but it would be great to also have student services, advisors um, at the session. And also um, the, the faculty of the gen ed courses that are, um, that are represented in the program. Um, so these are examples from the, uh, the medical assistant certificate was on the left and um, early childhood we did, uh, we've done several mapping sessions, uh, some of which were one program at a time and, and we've done a couple larger sessions which is interesting. Um, need to get to my notes. So um, some of the benefits of these mapping sessions themselves, the process is as important to us as the product. There's tremendous engagement. There's a lot of energy that's generated when faculty come together to do this work. We start out by um, the faculty come in the room. We have post-its and Sharpies, and we ask them to write down their course number and name and put it up on the map approximately where it lands in the program. And then they start to talk about what the connections are between the courses. And they also engage with each other in a way that does not always happen for faculty. Um, we do include, we invite adjuncts and we pay them to come uh, and be involved in these sessions. It's really critically important that we uh, involve and, and try to schedule these at times when adjuncts can come. 
um, for, s for our allied health programs. We don't even have a full-time faculty member for many of our programs. They're all adjuncts. So it's really critically important that they feel included and they feel like they are um, participating and their input is valued. So they take some ownership of the, the representation of the, ma of the program as is and um, talk about how it might change. Okay. Another thing that happens during these mapping sessions is that they start to look at the context of their course and the flow through the program. So every faculty member sees how his or her course um, relates to the other courses in the program and how the student experiences the flow through the program. So um, this was the dental assistant certificate mapping session that we did. And what becomes obvious in this is that flow through the program. Uh, when we did this with the, the medical assisting program, uh, there was a point when, when the, stu the faculty realized that, that the flow wasn't quite right, and actually that happened in the dental assisting program as well. The flow through the program wasn't quite right. There was a course that came late in the program that had outcomes that really should have been achieved earlier in the program for the ultimate success of uh, meeting the program learning outcomes. So those conversations happen in a way that they just don't when f adjuncts come rushing in to teach their course and then rush home. Um, and if there are full-timers, they might have a chance to talk about these things together, but often not, and often not with adjuncts as well. Okay, next. So another thing that can happen in these mapping sessions is that um, faculty can identify redundancies in the curriculum and also gaps in the curriculum. In this process, this was the business technology um, AAS being mapped, so these are all uh, full-time faculty in the business department. And um, the writing instructor in the business department actually recognized they had a proofreading and editing course that was a required course for the program. But they also have a two-term business writing course. And the instructor herself said, wait a minute, I should be, those outcomes are embedded in the two writing courses, there shouldn't, we shouldn't need a third course for proofreading and editing. She said, if I'm doing my job in BT 113 and 114, we shouldn't need this additional course. So they were able to take it out of their program. Um, and that just happened in spring, so um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, it was the faculty member herself who made that choice to get rid of that course, which um, is a very happy <laughs> outcome, I think, of this process. Um, another example, I don't have a slide for this, but the Criminal Justice Department um, mapped their two-year program, and they realized in the process, they had three program learning outcomes, and they realized that they really needed a capstone course that would allow the students to integrate what they had learned and, and demonstrate achievement of all of the program learning outcomes. So they created the capstone course, and that became the final course in their program. Okay. So um, this is what we call um, a second generation map. This is what it looks like at the end of a mapping session, or actually um, second generation because this was at the end of two sessions. So um, that first session, the faculty get this all down and they draw the line showing the connections between courses and they also identify where they think the program learning outcomes are um, addressed and assessed. So in this, in this version of the map, there were lots of places where those program learning outcomes were, um, were identified, or the assessment points. Um, it's messy and it's intentional. It's, it's meant to be messy. It's just a process of creating these um, visuals and uh, working together. And <laughs> um, we, d we actually mapped some math sequences in the summer. And the, um, the faculty were having some trouble drawing lines that crossed other lines. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the faculty members said, you have to understand, Lori, this is really outside of our comfort zone. <laughs> 
And I said, please, just draw that arrow. And it was just a connection between two courses that they realized was there, but they hadn't seen before. So it is messy, and it starts an ongoing conversation about where and how to assess the program learning outcomes. So uh, we can look at all of those places where the faculty identified as potential assessment points for the program learning outcomes. And then we can start thinking about the best place to do that assessment. So is there, for instance, is there a really good authentic assessment in one of those courses that is much like what the student is going to be doing out there in their job as a medical assistant. So that would be a good place. Um, and or can we choose assessments that are as close to the end of the program as possible so that students have the best chance of demonstrating that they've achieved that outcome. And we have the best chance of showing that our program is strong because the students are meeting those outcomes. So in the first version, go ahead and hit it, I'm not sure, oh yeah. So in this first version of the map, the question was, do we want PLO assessment points throughout the program, terms one, two, and three, or do we want them all as late as possible? Okay, so this is, now this is what we call a third generation map, even though that one says second. Third generation is where we actually get it into electronic form, which is not a trivial task. Um, and I've been doing these all myself, which um, my boss, who's here, keeps saying, well, we're gonna get you help, we're gonna get you help. Uh, <laughs> hey, thanks for calling that out. <laughs> <laughs> I also need to ask for it, but I've been kind of wedded to these maps, so I haven't, um, they haven't gotten out of my hands yet. So this is the electronic version of what you saw earlier, a little bit cleaned up, but what the faculty decided is that, yes, we want to put all seven, uh, the assessments of all seven of those program learning outcomes in that final term in a um, practicum and seminar course. So that makes some sense. The challenge then is making sure that there are assessments in that practicum course that actually align with all seven of the program learning outcomes, if, so that you can drill down and look at each program learning outcome and see whether students are achieving each of those program learning outcomes. And that's been a, I mean, it's great to say this is where we wanna do it, but for, uh, for the practicum courses, if it's an offsite employer who's providing that practicum experience, we might not be able to get that kind of assessment done by that person. So that's kind of a, an ongoing question. It, does that really make sense? Ideally, it's great, but practically, how can we really do that assessment? Or do we need, a, need to move it to the courses that are, um, the assessments are under control of the program faculty? So that's an ongoing conversation. Okay, so what about the system of assessment? Um, here's a representation of what we're doing at the program learning outcome level. And this is from a book that is uh, part of this framework called the Sustainability Primer. Um, so we see kind of the, just a general vision of what a program might look like. We're collecting evidence of the program learning outcomes at the course level, so much like what Christy said. We're choosing the course learning outcomes that align with the program learning outcomes doing that assessment, and then what this swirl here represents is uh, our reflection, our thinking about what we need to change at the program level based on um, what, what we found in those assessments. Okay, so this shows then uh, the, the iteration of program learning outcome assessment. So you do the assessment at the course level, you reflect on the evidence and see what it means for those program learning outcomes. Make some adjustments, and it's actually then not quite the same program anymore once you make those adjustments. And then that becomes the cycle of um, program learning outcome assessment and the, the flow of learning evidence. Then um, you can sort of think of it as a slightly new program, or sometimes more than slightly, every time you do it. So the example, um, a couple of examples, one was from dental assisting, where they realized that their, um, uh, this has, wasn't actually the result of 
learning outcomes assessment, I don't think, but they realized that their dental materials course was in the last term of the program and it really needed to be sooner. So, uh, and I think that was probably based on um, indirect uh, evidence from reports from the faculty, reports from employers, reports from the students themselves. So they moved it to a different place in the, um, in the program. They moved it to the second term, which made a lot more sense for the students in terms of what they had to do later in the program. But it wasn't the same program anymore. So we're always making those adjustments, and it's a slightly different program. Okay. So um, the quote here from Ruth Steele, who uh, is the, was designer of this framework to begin with, is the key to avoiding the last minute rush to prove we are accountable is creating a steady, continuous flow of evidence. Um, and, you know, we've had the experience with program reviews at the college and um, to some extent accreditation where, oh my God, it's accreditation time or it's our year for program review. Now we have to work really hard to create the flow of evidence to demonstrate that we're doing what we uh, need to do. And so the, the way to avoid that kind of high blood pressure stress is to make sure that you're continually um, collecting the evidence and that you have a flow of evidence. So I just want to drill down <laughs> specifically into um, what we're doing. I've been meeting with the diesel technology department because they have a program review coming up this December. So um, just going to talk through the steps in building their program assessment plan. Okay. Um, so this is what their map looked like. It is not yet in electronic form, but I have promised them it will be by the time they turn in their program review report. Um, so they had five program learning outcomes. And the question they're asking is, um, specifically for program learning outcome one, which is work within OSHA, RCC, and current industry safety guidelines and standards to promote a safe working environment. The question is, uh, where is that best assessed? It's that same question again. And they had it when they did the mapping, it was in three different places in three different courses. But they concluded that it's best assessed in this course DS260, which is in the last program, the last um, term of the program. And it's a, um, it's a hydraulic systems course. Okay. So um, they examined all of the course learning outcomes, looking for the one that best aligns. If that's where you want to assess it, then which course learning outcome are you assessing that can align with that program learning outcome? Um, there are 14 course learning outcomes, and there are a lot of courses still that have way too many course learning outcomes, but you know that's part of our ongoing process of cleaning up the course, outli the course outcomes and the course outlines. They concluded that course learning outcome two aligns with this program learning outcome. Course learning outcome two says describe the seven safety hazards of working with hydraulics and hydraulic systems. Um, so the assessment of the course learning outcomes should already be being done. So this, this is sort of in agreement with what Christy said. We're, we're doing the assessment at the course level aligning it with the program learning outcome. And um, these assessments already are being done. Hopefully there's a pretty straight line between the course learning outcome and the assessment that's being used. So we can say, yes, that assessment uh, specifically assesses course learning outcome two, and then we can demonstrate how, that, how well um, the students overall are meeting the program learning outcome. And then where there are weaknesses in the outcome achievement by students, the program faculty can discuss the adjustments that they want to make. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a tool that uh, just makes it easier to sort of keep track of what they're doing. It's called the course adjustment planning tool. And they can pull um, direct evidence of the learning outcomes from those assessments in the courses. And they can also pull any indirect evidence that might be related to the program learning outcome. For instance, um, self-assessments by students, uh, reports by employers, um, student evaluations of instruction to the extent that those ask specific questions about 
course learning um, outcomes. So we have both direct and indirect evidence. And this is just a tool to kind of create an action plan to help the department figure out what they want to change based on what they found. Okay. So the building, building the assessment plans starts with aligning the program learning outcomes with the course learning outcomes. And I'll just stick it take a step back and say, when I started in this position, which was three years ago, um, one of our, um, I don't remember where the rogue feedback is, but the, the feedback we got from accreditors was to make sure that all of our PLOs were published and um, accessible to students. And uh, I discovered um, that there were a lot of PLOs stored in a lot of different places. And um, when I asked, I brought them to the departments and they would say, where did these come from? <laughs> um, and what are they? And a lot of them were not really learning outcome statements. They were statements of um, outcomes that the department wanted. So we had a lot of work to do in just, it just even cleaning up the pro program learning outcomes and made, making sure that they were in a format that could be um, found and identified. Okay, so. Um, and then the next step, once, once that alignment is done, and I'm not saying that's easy or quick, um, to make that alignment, and then collect the assessment data at the course level, adjust the course curriculum based on that evidence. So it's all, all the adjustments are always happening at the course level once that alignment is made, and then repeat. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, right? Repeat steps two and three to close the loop. Okay. So this is what the program learning outcome assessment cycle looks like. Year one, um, the, the, the department is choosing, or the program, but honestly it's the department who's doing it, um, is choosing which program learning outcomes they're going to focus on this particular year, identifying the courses and the course learning outcomes, collecting the data, gathering and displaying the evidence, and deciding what, they're gonna, what changes they're going to make, hopefully improvements. At that point, there might be um, some sharing. That might be their program review year. Or they could share with, we have a, a process in faculty senate for a peer dialogue. So faculty can take their, uh, their results to the faculty senate and get feedback. We also have um, now a council, a peer feedback council that's part of the program review process. So they could come there and um, get feedback. Then year two, they implement the changes. And then year three, they do another assessment. So they're assessing the impact of those changes. So every one of the PLO um, assessments is happening over a three-year cycle. But there could be one, two, three, or more uh, program learning outcomes being looked at every year. Ideally, this is happening on a three-year cycle overall. So by the end of three years, every program learning outcome has been at least assessed. So there might be a staggered set of uh, results over three years. Okay. So we're also asking departments to uh, just build that plan, just that cycle. Which PLOs are you going to look at each year? Um, and then with the idea that there's that three-year cycle. Which ones are you looking at this year? And then adjusting next year, and then reassessing the year after. Um, okay, so for Rogue, this is a work in progress. We did redesign our program review um, in the summer of 2016, and that was done by Kirk, our vice president, and also all the deans, and I was the faculty um, representative on that team. Um, several of the, the new requirements are that all degree certificate programs have maps, those kinds of maps, and that they plan their PLO assessment cycle, they collect whatever data they can collect um, at that point in the process. We did our, uh, a very fast track pilot of our program review process last spring. Um, we had five volunteer departments who went first, which always, um, there's a tremendous amount of gratitude to the departments who will go first. And um, this part was challenging, the, the PLO assessment data, because we haven't been thinking in those terms. Um, and so some departments did a great job, some departments didn't really tackle it yet. And um, as the next year rolls out, there's, there's going to be more, um, 
more uh, intrusive advising <laughs> of the departments, um, mostly with me because I work with all the departments as they're working on their program reviews. So they just need to start working on this, whether this is their year for program review or it's two years from now. Um, the sooner they get started on it, the sooner they will um, uh, have evidence to show at that, um, at that program review point. So some of the next things for RCC, mapping transfer degrees. We haven't even tackled that yet. We've been looking at the two-year, the Associate of Applied Science degrees because that's easier in terms of the program learning outcomes. We kind of have that. Um, we have a little more control over that. So mapping those transfer degrees um, requires working with the four-year institutions. Um, we had a great session with um, the, the group of faculty who teach our engineering focus of our um, Associate of General Studies degree. So we had, um, we had an engineering instructor, math instructor, physics instructor, and um, they wanted to map out the sequences for three engineering focuses, or foci, foci, um, civil, electronic, uh, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. So we mapped three different sequences, and then they wanted it to also reflect each of the three institutions that those students typically go to, which is Oregon State, Portland State, and Oregon Tech. So, uh, and I sent them away with the three that, w that I facilitated for the, for the civil, electrical, and mechanical. And they were going to go then and map to the, the three different institutions. So, w so they said, well, we're gonna need nine different maps. Um, for each of those options. Um, and I think that that is something that is definitely going to be looked at with the new, um, the new, is it Senate bill or House bill? House bill. House bill, yeah. So there's, um, there's definitely a lot of thinking and collaboration when we start thinking about mapping those transfer degrees, okay? And then mapping gen ed learning outcomes in programs. We haven't really addressed that in our mapping so far. Um, but we do have at least a couple of Gen Ed courses in every program. Every program has a math co at least one math course and at least one writing course. So thinking about how we're doing our Gen Ed um, mapping and assessment within programs is something we're, um, we're starting to think a lot about. Um, and both of those issues are going to be talked about in the panel discussion this afternoon. And then adding guided pathways features to our maps. So um, we are embarking to whatever degree on the guided pathways. Um, uh, we're embracing the guided pathways. <laughs> and um, some of the things that are critical in the guided pathways maps are that you identify the critical courses and milestones. So we've only really started to think about um, how to incorporate those things into our maps and also how to incorporate the, the student services side. So when we think about the learner's journey, it's not just the, the core uh, program itself. It's all of those other things that happen um, for and with students on their journey. The financial aid, the advising piece. And um, so I really want to include the student services piece in um, the next iteration of these maps. Every map is just a snapshot in time. And if we're really going to ref reflect the student's journey, we need to figure out how to represent that part of it as well. So visual tools give us the power to think more strategically, to build and represent coherence, sequencing, and synthesis of learning, to see the alignment of course and program learning outcomes, and to keep the learner in mind. Okay. And just to always remember that it's the learner's journey. These are actual diesel program students um, in this picture. Okay. And uh, yeah, so there's my contact information and I will send out these slides as well. So questions for Lori. Stunned silence. Yeah. When you, uh, in one of the last slides, you said your next project is to map general education learning outcomes in mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which one, which general education learning outcomes are you referring to? Are they AAOT or are they ones that your institution has developed for itself? That's a great question. <laughs> this is our Gen Ed and Transfer Dean right here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't have a, we don't have our strategy yet. Um, there are there are a lot of options. Oh, good, Kirk is grabbing the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> I saw the meaningful. Please, Kirk. <laughs> I I think we're in a process of trying to ferret that out. We started with the JBAC outcomes, and simply because I I didn't think we had the institutional will or bandwidth to try to do all of this at one time. So we took an easy starting point. What I'm actually oddly happy about is that there is great dissatisfaction with those outcomes, which is in and of itself momentum to look at this problem from our own perspective. I like our name. I'd rather it be a rogue outcome than one that doesn't fit right. So I think we've got momentum now, oddly enough, because we are unhappy. And there's a related question about institutional learning outcomes, and I think this was kind of a, um, a guiding question for this afternoon also, but the question is, are gen ed outcomes the same as institutional learning outcomes? And we developed a set of institutional learning outcomes, uh, oh, it was almost 10 years ago now. And, um, uh, and we've kind of been holding off on going back to look at that, at those, because we really needed to get the program learning outcome piece in place. But we definitely need to go back and, and review those institutional learning outcomes. Think about what they mean, because it, they sort of got to a point where faculty couldn't relate to them anymore. And think about the difference between the institutional learning outcomes and our gen ed outcomes. And that's just, that's work that we need to do this year. Another question for Lori? Great. Well, thank you. Join me in thanking Lori. For <laughs> so now comes a moment that's one of my personal favorites, lunch. Uh, so lunch is uh, set up out in the lobby. It's a buffet style lunch, so just help yourselves. Um, come back in here and kind of chew on not only the lunch, but also what you heard this morning and some different pieces that might be of interest to you um, because the panel will be right after lunch. So um, for the folks that are streaming, we're going to take an hour for lunch and then we'll join back up about, um, that'd be what, quarter to one? So we'll take a break. Thank you.